Greetings to everyone! In today's video I will tear down quite an unusual Morans model, which is this DH9300 music server. To confuse you a little bit more, I will say that it's not really Marantz. Don't worry, I will explain everything in a second. Before I start, I'd like to encourage you to subscribe to this channel, follow me on Instagram or even consider supporting future videos on Patreon. All the links are included in the description. So this is Marantz DH9300 music server. I bought two of them on eBay quite a while ago. They were sold as broken, but I thought that it might be an interesting challenge to try and fix them. When I opened the first one, I discovered that power supply was missing. Then when I looked inside the other one, I saw that the power supply was in place. However, the unit wasn't booting up still. That was a clear sign that the power supply was not alright. It was very fortunate that DH9300 used a standard type PSU, so it was not hard to find a replacement. I ordered a slightly more powerful power supply made by Minwell and I was very excited to see the unit booting up with no problems right after I replaced the faulty PSU. And now as I got this unit working, let me quickly explain more about it. As its name suggests, it's a music server. It can work as a ordinary CD player, but its main purpose is to rip your CD collection into a built-in 80 GB hard drive. Then music stored on the internal hard drive can be played in four independent zones around the house. Also it can burn music onto CDs and read CD text. Let me know if you would be interested to see how this unit operates, as I am thinking of making a separate video dedicated to that. But now I will tear it down and give it a good clean. As with most CD players, I have to remove the escutcheon from the tray first, as otherwise it wouldn't let me remove the front panel later. When it is done and the unit is powered down, I can disconnect AC input and DC output cables from the power supply. I have to be careful as it still holds some charge and I can get an electric shock if I touch some of the elements. The power supply was fixed with four screws originally, but two of them are missing. Marantz DH9300 requires a bipolar 12V and a regular 5V power supply. My next step would be disconnecting a 40-pin IDE interface cable linking the CD drive with the main board. A 40-pin ribbon cable linking the main board with the 80 GB hard drive can be disconnected too. I will disconnect this short link between PSU and main boards next, so it doesn't get in the way. And it appears that the front PCB is linked with the main board with same 40-pin ribbon cable. A 4-pin peripheral power cable can be disconnected next. This cable provides a current for HDD and optical drives. After 4 screws are undone, I can separate the hard drive bracket from the chassis. I want to clean as many components as I can. That is why I will take this bracket off and try to pull this rubber protection. Thank you. 
after an intense cleaning procedure for which I've used a cloth with a bit of IPA, the rubber protection can come back to its original place. Now when the hard drive looks clean and shiny, I will remove the IEC socket. By the way, it's not just an IEC socket, it's a fused IEC mains filter power inlet. I guess my next step would be to remove the fan, which is fixed with four screws to the side of the chassis. Now using 99% pure IPA and a bunch of cotton buds, I will give it a fundamental clean. I am really pleased with the result. Next, I will remove the ASUS CD drive. Four screws which are securing its bracket have to be undone first. Oh, I almost forgot to disconnect the digital audio output cable. Now when the drive is extracted, I will undo another four screws to remove the bracket. It appears that it's not only screwed in, but they are glued together too. I have to use a flat screwdriver to pry the bracket and finally separate it from the drive. The first time that I opened the CD tray it sounded a bit rattly. That's a clear sign that gear wheels need some fresh silicon grease. Alright, let's undo these six screws and have a look at what is going on there. I will power up this CD drive and open the tray up. This operation will allow me to remove it without too much hassle. Now when the CD tray is removed, the next step would be to take off the belt as well as three plastic gear wheels. They look perfectly clean to me. So using cotton buds I will evenly apply a small amount of silicone grease on all moving parts. It is important to put just a small amount of grease and spread it as much as possible. Otherwise it would put an extra load on the motor while opening and closing the tray. Great, I think that's enough and the tray can come back to its original position. Before putting the whole drive back together, I will power it up to make sure that it works as it should. And of course a quick cleaning procedure wouldn't hurt. Great, let's put it back together and hear the result. I believe that you would agree that now it sounds better than before. Now that I'm done with the optical drive, time to carry on and remove the front panel. The cable linking the front PCB with the tiny online and power switch boards has to be disconnected first. After that's done, three screws securing the front panel to the inside of the chassis can be removed. As well as another four screws which are securing it from the bottom. And now the front panel made of solid piece of aluminium can be easily removed. It is a little bit unusual that the front PCB is not attached to the front panel. However, it's not an average CD player. Okay, let's undo these seven screws and extract the front PCB. 
It appears that this board is still held by this copper sticky tape which surrounds the front display. After carefully lifting this sticky tape with my handy prying tool, I can finally remove this PCB. And of course I will give it a very good clean. Nothing too extraordinary about this PCB. Here we can see a display that has become a bit dim after all the years of operation. More than a dozen micro switches and an IR receiver. On the rear side of the board you can see an 8-bit CMOS flash microcontroller. It converts commands received from the IR remote control or navigational buttons into commands which the main CPU of the unit can read and execute. A 40-pin main connector is also here, as well as a 10-pin connector which is used to connect an on and off button and an online indicator. Great! Next goes this controller port which provides serial communication with supported devices. For instance, a multi-room control system may communicate with this music server using the XivaLink protocol. Audio extension PCB will be extracted next. It is not only held by 9 screws at the rear, but also with these two screws which are securing it to the main PCB. Now it is important to lift this PCB straight up, so these 32 pin extended connectors are safely disconnected. This PCB has RJ45 sockets which can be used to connect to Opus multi room control system, four 3.5mm jack modulated remote inputs which can receive remote control information from remote rooms directly into the music server. Three additional composite video outputs to allow TV sets to be connected to the music server which will display TV user interface. Analog audio output for Zone 1 and four RCA remote control inputs which can carry out the same functions as 3.5mm jack remote control inputs. On PCB itself you can see two 8-bit CMOS flash microcontrollers. One of them is processing data from two RJ45 connectors and the second one is dealing with data received from four RCA remote control inputs. These two chips are triple two-channel analog multiplexer demultiplexers. This yellowish chip is a very interesting component. It is a Toshiba 4-channel photocoupler. It electrically isolates four 3.5mm jack remote control inputs from the rest of the unit, while data is being transferred over optical elements inside the chip. And two more components which I wanted to mention are this Burr Brown Sound Plus audio operational amplifier with low distortion, low noise and precision. And this Sirius Logic 24-bit 98 kHz stereo DAC with volume control. Both of these two elements are designated for Zone 1 output. Before I can start working on the main PCB extraction, I have to remove the modem ASI. It is fixed with two screws to the rear panel of the unit. Again, I have to lift it straight up so I don't damage the 16-pin connector which links the modem with the main PCB. The modem can be used to connect the music server to a standard analog telephone line for internet access. Great, now it is time to undo 7 screws which are securing RCA connectors which are located on the main PCB. The screw which was securing the Ethernet socket I accidentally removed while extracting the modem. Six chunky screws are securing the main PCB to the chassis, alongside with these two plastic ones, which are also used to support an analog extension board. 
Here we go, the main PCB is successfully extracted. Now I will remove the random access memory module and CMOS battery so I can safely clean the main PCB using a 99.9% .9 pure IPA. Great, now after 50 minutes of intense cleaning the main PCB looks like new. For me this PCB looks like a motherboard from an old PC. Only a bunch of RCA connectors give away that it's not an ordinary motherboard. Let's take a look at connectors first. This is a 3.5mm jack connector, which allows music server to send control information to other supported devices. Right next to it you can see a standard USB Type-A socket. RJ45 Ethernet socket. VGA connector for displaying user interface on a compatible TV or monitor. Composite and S-Video connectors serve the same task as VGA. This is digital optical input which can be used to record music right on the built-in HDD. Digital optical output is tied with Zone 1 and cannot be reassigned. Coaxial input and output exactly mimic the optical ones. Next goes analog audio input, which can be used to record audio signal from analog sources. Three pairs of RCA connectors are analog audio outputs for zone 2, 3 and 4. This PCB can be divided into two sections, PC and audio section. Looking at the PC section, the first thing that you see is this heatsink, which is covering the main CPU. I have decided not to touch it as the risk is too high and I want to keep this unit in a proper working order. You can see a RAM slot, three IDE connectors and even a PCI slot next to the processor. One of the three largest chips you see here is Geode TM-CS5530A IO Companion Multifunction South Bridge. And another one is National Semiconductor Super IO Plug and Play compatible with ICPI Compliant Controller Extender. This removable chip right in the middle is a read-only memory which probably contains the BIOS for the machine. This focus enhancement chip is an iNet TV interface video processor. This IC ensemble chip is a PCI multi-channel I.O. controller. Alright, let's move on and see the audio section. This Sirius Logic chip is a sample rate converter. Here you can also find three Burr Brown operational amplifiers, identical to what we saw earlier on the audio extension board. DAX for zones 3 and 4 are also the same Sirius Logic stereo digital to analog converters with volume control. But DAC for zone 2 is different. It is this Asahi Kasai AK4524. And it's not just a DAC, it's a codec. It has an analog to digital converter inside the same component. This ADC is used to convert a signal that is coming from the RCA stereo input which I have mentioned earlier. So this is all that I can tell you about the main PCB. Now the only thing left to do is to take this 4 feet off so I can give a good clean to the chassis. Here we are, these are all chassis components, the cables and of course all the electronic parts. I believe that this is quite an unusual piece of equipment. During the teardown you probably spotted Xiva and Emerge logos all over the components. Remember I've told you this is not completely a Marantz product? 
As the unit is more than 20 years old, it was quite hard to find more information about it. On top of that, Xiva and Emerge no longer exist. I did manage to figure out that Marantz outsourced this product. While looking for more information, I found a few familiar looking units which were sold under different brands. I have tried to contact Marantz representative here in the UK explaining that I am making a video about the product, but after a few weeks wait, all I've got from them was a user manual. No words. Moran's office in the Netherlands was a bit more willing to help. At least they explained that they were unable to find any information that I have requested. I hope you have enjoyed watching this teardown. If this is the case, please give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to this channel. This is it for today, hope to see you soon, goodbye.